حلقی میکشه از بین خال صدیکی من میتیم شده غنم این خال صدیکی من میتیم شده خال قدوش من شده قدوش من شده قدوش من شده قدوش صدیکی سو دارم نخن نوه هم میکا خوخمه قبل نو نخن فکر من تیم خن نه نخ نخ من نخن من من خود دو دگه نه علمی نو من گالی سلامه اوکی وی آر این سیکشن 3 آر لسن 2 رایت نو I believe I'm not mistaken. Actually, no, we just did section four. We did section four last time. Yeah, we did section four. <clears throat> so yeah, we're talking about stack out right now. Yeah, I want to give you a sefer that way you guys can follow along. Cool. Take that one. Here. Here, Ezra. Take. Here, Ezra, show it to me. Come here. Yeah. Now this looks different. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, look where we're at. Welcome to Brussels. <laughs> I like that. So, Baruch Hashem, look where we are. Last class, we discussed the idea of how to attain Mishpat, how to attain justice. The Sinyan of the Amud Adem Saita, the middle pillar, right? Because the entire idea about Tfilah, which we're discussing right now, is that it stands in the middle, essentially. Because, because why? To attain Tfilah, you have to go through Mishpat first. Mishpat represents this concept of justice, and the main action of Mishpat in this world is tzedakah, to give charity. Why? Because tzedakah, when you give tzedakah, you're evening out everything. You're putting yourself in the middle. You're taking away from yourself, and you're lifting the poor person. Essentially, you're making you and the poor person equal. That there's no gadol, there's no katan, there's no big or small. It's everyone is together in the same, in the same level, madrega. And by doing that, essentially you're showing Hashem Mishpat. Why? Because... Um, Elokim Shofet Zeh Ashpi Bezeyarim It's in the verse Elokim Shofet Hashem is Shofet He's a judge He judges Zeh Ashpi Bezeyarim And how does he judge? He lifts Zeh Ashpi He lowers one Bezeyarim And he lifts another Essentially he takes the one who's low And he brings him up And he brings the one who's high low And that's how he's a Shofet That's how he's a judge That's what the job of the Tzadik is There was a praise that they said about Rabbeinu And about Rabbi Nachman a very big tzaddik. I forget which big tzaddik. It could have been the Chosev Lublin. I'm not sure. I'm not. Um, I forget. They said about Rabenu that why was he such a big tzaddik? Because the second he saw a big tzaddik, he could show him how low he was. And the second he saw a rasha, he could show him that Hashem was close to him. That's mishpat. This idea that what? The tzaddik's job is essentially to bring someone who who has a little bit of pride from the fact that he's high, to understand that he's very far from Hashem's God, to make this person understand, to instill within this person's mind that he has a long way to go. And the person who's very far from Hashem's God, to show him that Hashem's God is with him, even in the pits of hell. This is what it says in the Torah 7 of the Kutim Tinyana, that Moshe Rabbeinu is the, um, he's the ultimate prophet. And because of that, Moshe Rabbeinu stands at this concept of ma, meaning what? Meaning because he's so high, he has to lower himself constantly to make himself humble all the time to make lower himself so that what he doesn't get in this aspect of pride of gaba and yet, and the other navi like for example yechezkel or yeshaya they needed to reinforce themselves in a different fashion why because yeshaya wasn't at the same level as moshe rabbeinu what does that mean i think i believe it's yeshaya yeah can you double check uh, it's seven and two And that's why, by the way, Moshe Rabbeinu has to reinforce Yoshua. Why? Because Yoshua is a student. And the student constantly feels low. He's the moon. He doesn't really have much light of his own. So because he doesn't have much light of his own, of his own, he needs to be reinforced constantly. So Rabbeinu says, I was jealous of everyone. I'm jealous of you, my students, that you guys had a teacher like this and you had to reinforce you. The tzaddik always needs to lower himself, humble himself. The person who constantly feels low needs to reinforce himself that he has a way close to Hashem Ibach, that Hashem Ibach is with him. That's why if you look at the, the word, Hakitsu Wake up and sing those who dwell in the dust. 
Hakitu v'ren nu shochne atam. Rabbi Nachman teaches us. Take the first letters. Rashi kevod. Hakitu. He. V'ren nu vav. Shochne. Shin. Afar ayin. Hoshea. Et Yoshua. That what? The entire idea of Yoshua is to be reinforced to Moshe Rabbeinu. To tell him get up and sing, even from the dust, even from Gehenna. So Rabbi Nachman is teaching us this idea that, the, that Moshe Rabbeinu needs to lower himself. And he understands how to make the person who's very low high. Um, I just want to find it. If I don't find it, then... <clears throat> oh, right here. Dare Manabe Dare Matre. It's right here. Um... Yeah, and exactly, Yeshaya. Yeshaya was at a lower level than Moshe Rabbeinu. This is why Yeshaya, it says about his prophecy in chapter 6, by Et Hashem, and I beheld Hashem, I saw Hashem. Whereas Moshe Rabbeinu says what? What did Moshe Rabbeinu say? It says about Moshe that when he came up before Hashem, Hashem tells him, Lo yir ani adam v'chai. No man can see me and live. But Yeshaya says, I saw Hashem. Why? Because Moshe Rabbeinu needs to say that he never sees him. That he's always moving forward. I always need to get to the next level to see Hashem. I always need to push myself more. Because it's Sadiq, he's at such a high degree and such a high level, he needs to constantly make himself an Arab. Because he's always running. Rabbi Nachman says, like this in, in Chayim Moran, he says, for most of the Tzadikim, most of the Tzadikim, it's very difficult for them to run. For most of the world, he says, the concept of running is very difficult. It's not, it's not attainable for them. The idea that, well, what does it mean to run? To always be engaged in Avodat Hashem. To always be engaged in serving Hashem. Even in the Sikhat Khulin that you do, even in the mundane conversation that you do, you're actually of Kabana of Hashem Yitbach. Everything that you do and you engage in, whether it's uh, work, whatever it might be, everything is Avodat Hashem. That's very difficult. There's very, very few people that are, in, that are at this level of the generation. Of course. You know? Because who can be at the level where they're constantly in Avodat Hashem, where there's no break? So we're, that's what we're talking about, Moshe Rabbeinu, right? At the, that degree. <coughs> Rabbi Nachman says, for most of the generation, the idea of running is very difficult. For the true tzaddik, he says, for someone like me, it's very difficult to return. The hard part is the returning. Because what's more difficult? For someone like us, the difficult part is to run, to do the Abba Hashem. We get distracted very easily, you know? We want to waste time while we eat. We want to watch this thing. We want to go relax. We want to take an hour nap during the day. Whatever it is that we're doing. For the tzaddik, he didn't even think about that. He's constantly engaged in Avodat Hashem and he, he, he's in it. You cannot stop him. What's the hard part for him? To return back into the world and to engage in the world. So that's Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu is at this level, this Madrega. Nobody understands him. Nobody. So what does Hashem Ibar tell him? No man can see me and live. Moshe, stop. There's a long way to go for Moshe Rabbeinu. That's what Rabbi Nachman said in Chaim Moran. That he says like this, that um, he attained the Tachlit Madrega by Yachida. He attained the highest level on the soul of the Yachida. And when he attained the highest level on the soul of the Yachida, he said a phrase like this after. He said, and perhaps there's more. Ulayesh Oh, perhaps there's a little bit more left. There's more left to go. Which means what? Even at the Yachida, the highest of all levels, at the highest degree of all the, high, of all the souls, there's still more to go, meaning what? That even if the Tzadik Moshe Rabbeinu can see the, the back of Hashem's, uh, the Tzfilin of Hashem's back, the knot of the Tzfilin of the back of the, Hashem's head, then what? Moshe Rabbeinu is still running. There's never stopping for Moshe Rabbeinu. So he never suffices with what he has. He's always pushing himself. But Yeshaya needs to say, Ba'aret Hashem, I beheld Hashem. Because Yeshaya is at a lower level than Moshe. And he needs reinforcement. He needs to reinforce himself. This is the perception of those who dwell at the lower level. This is us. We need to constantly be reinforced. Which is why Rabbi Nachman teaches us the lesson of Azamra. To find the good points. 282. 282. That's the main thing of a Jew. Today. Because no one at this level of, uh, of, uh, of Tzadik Haimet anymore. We're all Talmidim. <laughs> if we even have the merit to be Talmidim. So what? We have to constantly reinforce. Nikud Otovot. And the other Jew find a good point. Even if he didn't see the good point, you have to find it for him. And engaging in this positive attitude, but not only that, you change the entire world. You change the entire world, you change the person's neshama. You change the scale of their neshama for the entire world. We have no idea what we're doing. Just by judging people positively. That reinforces them. That gives them the ability to do tshuva. 
Rabbi Nachman said that Yochel Shibo B'Tshuva. Now they're able to do Tshuva because of that. Why? Because you you judge them positively. You know, it's an entirely different perspective. This is Bechinat Melochor Aretz Kavodo. For the people that are dwelling in the earth, we have to understand that Melochor Aretz Kavodo, Hashem's earth, Hashem's glory fills the entire earth. Meaning, even for us, people who are in the Achziut and the Gashmiut of this world, you know, the materialism of this world. Oh, la la. What's going on? Hey, how are you? Good to see you. How's it going? Joe, how's that, bro? What's going on, bro? How are you? Oh, yeah, that's a suit jacket, right? No, yeah, I mean, you're not doing it. Um, so that's what we're talking about right now. That's it. Sadiq, essentially, he needs to constantly reinforce the students. When the students are at a low level, he needs to show them, be chazak, be strong. To Rabbi Nachman said in Chayim Moran. To Rabbi Nachman said in Chayim Moran that this idea. But he says, you guys can become Tzadikim Gmurim. Complete Tzadikim. You know what Tzadik Gamur means? To understand this, to go to lesson 8 of Moshe Moran. A Tzadik Gamur is a person who has completely destroyed his desires to the point where he's not even afraid of a sin. Not even afraid. Meaning what? You get to the point where you have no desire for immorality, no desire for money, no desire for, for kavod, no desire for food. Everything you're engaging in is about that Hashem. And aside from that, you're not even scared that you're going to commit a sin because you're so, you're so confident that the Yitzhak is not even there anymore. It's like, it's an ability to completely destroy your Yitzhak There's no tabot anymore. All your damim, all your blood, all your dam is completely purified. You know lesson six where we talk about when you get embarrassed, how the blood of the left side of the heart gets put into the face and then it gets spilled out. Why? Because the person who gets embarrassed is as if he's being killed, his blood is being spilled. So that blood of the left ventricle of the heart is being spilled out. Rabbi well, I Nachman mean, saying when you get embarrassed and you stay silent, essentially you're removing the ta'avot of the blood of the left ventricle of the heart. Which means what? All your ta'avot for immorality. Rabbi mean, Nachman says lesson six is Segula Tafaner Zibu. So what Shmiha Tabrit? All your tabot have to do with all these things that come from blood, for example, murder, anger, sexual morality. All these things that come from the blood, that is all removed when you stay silent when you're embarrassed. Why? Because the blood is purified. So this is all a game of blood, Rabbi Nachman is teaching us. Lesson 8, he says like this, a tzaddik amu, the difference between a tzaddik and a tzaddik amu is that a tzaddik is still afraid. He didn't have any, ta- he didn't have any sins. And he will not do commit a sin. But he's still afraid that if he's placed in a position of it, he might do it. Whereas the tzaddik gamu is not even afraid of it. Not even afraid. Rabbi Nachman says, with a drop of that, with a drop of consciousness, you will not even be afraid if a woman is still in the same room with you and you're in private and you will not do anything. Why? Because Rabbi Nachman says, all it takes is one drop of that or chokhmah to get rid of the desire. Which comes to show us that we are so far from Chokhmah, we don't even have one drop of it. Because if we had one drop, that would be enough, we wouldn't even have any Ta'avot. The fact that we still have Ta'avot shows that we don't, even, we don't even tap into one drop of Chokhmah. And why is that? Because our mind is uh, it's, uh, putrid. It's, it's been filled with all this, for example, uh, immoral thoughts or but took another philosophies, you know? All these things that have made our mind go crazy and essentially make it very difficult to bring in Chokhmah. So Rabbi Nachman saying the entire Indian of breaking the Tabot is through Sechel, through intellect. Which is why when you study Torah, you don't really have the Tabot because you're in, instilling that Da'at. The hard part is keeping that Da'at. So that when you go to work, you don't have the Tabot. When you're at work, your mind is focused on numbers, okay? You're at the office or your mind is focused on cooking, whatever it is that you do. You know what I mean? Planning this and that. Whatever it is that you're doing. So your mind isn't occupied in another place. It has a different sechel, right? But when you enter the sechel of the Torah, you lose the desire in the first place. Which is why it's in the Torah, matish koach shaladam. It weakens the strength of a person, which is why it's very difficult for a person. It's why it's in the Gemara. The Tamid Chacham usually only has, is with his wife from Friday night to Friday night. Why? Because the Torah weakens it. <laughs> Aside from the fact that it doesn't even necessarily, it might not even have the Torah. He's a real Tamid Chacham. Because Tamid Chacham means to be a student of Chokhmah. If you really have Chokhmah, you'll recognize this, this entire Tava is and stupid. So it's all a game of, of the mind. Rabbi Nachman saying the entire Yitzhak today is the Koach 
It's the ma- imagination because our imagination creates a, f- a story that doesn't exist. It's not even there. It tries to create a story that makes us think we'll be happy when it's not even happy because uh, it, it didn't su- sustain, it didn't fulfill anything. Unless you do be too shy. The second something is kadosh, the second it becomes fulfilled. Fulfill. So being with your wife becomes kadosh, it becomes fulfilled. It's, a bi- it's one of the biggest mitzvahs in the entire Torah. The first thing, the ruhu. You know, all these things. So Rabbeinu says in lesson 8, look what he says here. That the difference between a tzaddik gamur and a tzaddik is the fact that a tzaddik gamur is not even afraid of doing a sin. Lo al it, it won't even enter his ability to, to do it. Because he's completely destroyed his tabot entirely. That's the difference between a, the tzaddik here and there. And Rabbeinu said like this in Chayim Oran. I can promise my students that what? They can become tzaddikim borim as long as they attach themselves to one of my true students. Echad One of my true students. Which means what? Find a person who understands the Torah of Rabbeinu, Be'emet, Be'emet Namito, someone who really understands this Torah, and to study it with him until you completely remove all your desires. The problem is, we don't have emunah in the dibur of Rabbeinu, we don't have emunah in the speech of Rabbeinu, in the words of Rabbeinu, that we can get to that level. So we lower ourselves, we give ourselves less, we, give, we put limitations on ourselves. Why? Because we don't even pray to get there. But what if I told you to start praying to get there? It's possible. Because Rabbeinu said it. That's the only reason. Because Rabbi Nachman said you can become a tzaddik amor. Tzaddik amor. Just by being attached to him. But Rabbeinu says the condition is that you attach yourself to one of my students. Of course, it's Rabbi Nachman. Open up Likut Arachot. Just tell him Likut Arachot. Likut Etzfirot. You want to break all your, your tabot? It's Likut Etzfirot. What Rabbeinu says, he bought a new all the advice Rabbeinu gives us, lesson 52 of the Yudha Moran, Rabbeinu says, go do Yibodidut every single night, every single night, alone, at Chatzot, go do Yibodidut until all your desires are broken. And Rabbeinu says, you'll be able to do it. You'll go from one desire, you'll break one desire. You'll go to the next desire, you'll break the other one. You won't even be eating. You'll be at the level of Rabbi Natan, in which it says that he just ate a little bit and was sustained. One time Rabbi Natan was at a motel with his friend, who was traveling, he was traveling throughout the city. This was after Rabbeinu passed away. And uh, Rabbi Natan was at the motel, was a uh, Jewish person who was running the entire motel, the manager. He was serving chicken soup that night. So Rabbi Natan, okay, he op- opens up a spoon with the chicken soup. He and his friend are eating across the table from each other. Takes one bite, second bite, third bite, fourth bite. So the fourth bite, he starts lifting up his spoon and putting it down before he takes it. Lifting up his spoon again and putting it down. And his friend is talking to him while this is happening. So the friend notices after a few minutes while they're having a conversation, Rabbi Natan keeps putting his spoon back without taking a sip. Yeah, he thinks he's nuts. So he tells Rabbi Natan, he says, Rabbi Natan, what are you doing? Rabbi Natan says, don't you get it? I don't even know whether this spoon is ta'avat achilah or not yet. Meaning what? I'm debating whether I need this other spoon to survive or not. Of chicken soup. So literally water and vegetables and chicken. That's the level we have to strive for. Because if you do not strive for there, we're gonna strive for something lower. And if you strive for something lower, you're gonna get, arrive here. That's a breast effort. You know what, you know what Rabbeinu says? Shoot for the, uh, the high space and you'll, aim, you'll land somewhere here. You know what somewhere here is? At Sadiq and Mosque. That's what Rabbeinu says, don't lower your expectations. Michael, good to see you, okay. Don't lower your expectations. Don't limit yourself by what you think you can do. Because honestly, Arlan, good to see you, Arlan. Good to see you, too. If you think you can do something, if you think you only have this level, you have much, much higher. So the main thing is to lower yourself, to lower, to, what do you call it, to, to put your expectation to the highest degree, to believe that you can attain the highest thing in the world. Even though you did all these things, to still have Allah Hamim on yourself, to believe that you can go there. So you can become Tzadik Because Rabbi Nachman said so. Why? Because Rabbi Nachman said, any one of his students can become a tzaddik Because the advice is here. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai brought the Zohar, Kadosh. But the Zohar today, is all this, it's all the Zohar. You want the secret of the Zohar to become a tzaddik? Because Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai wrote it all. But all the advice is here. All the advice of the Zohar is in the Zohar. All the advice of Et Chaim is in Tzikwa Masyot. So we have to train ourselves to really believe in Abdi Yamuna that we can get to that degree. And that's what Rabbeinu is teaching us with this lesson specifically, lesson section four we're, we're talking about, right? This idea of tzedakah. 
that before a person prays, gets the level of tefillah, understanding what prayer is, he needs to give charity before tefillah. When you pray in the morning, you need to give staka before. Why? Because staka represents mishpat, justice. Staka evens out the playing field. When you give staka, you lower yourself, you lower the person who has money, and you give the poor person who doesn't have money elevation. And essentially, you're evening yourself out. With it. Is, there, is there a specific amount? Or Rabenu says, with regard to staka, First off, if it's going to mean consistency, start low. Yeah. And build it up. Of course, the more you give, the more you're strengthening your emuna. Rabbeinu says in lesson four of the Bita Mohan Tinyana, that the main idea of tzedakah is to break the achzariyut and to turn it into rachmanut. Break your cruelty and turn it into compassion. Which means what? The second it hurts to give, that amount that it hurts to give, that's the amount. When you know when you give, you, know, you see a person across the street, you wanna give tzedakah but you don't have cash, okay? And they pull out the credit card then, you know? They're starting, they, they got the new idea. Right? Yeah. They pull out the Venmo. I take Venmo too. You don't have any excuse. But how much are you going to give? You, can, you might have five bucks cash. You can only give five. But now the guy has Venmo. What are you going to do? If it hurts to give ten, if it hurts to give ten, if your eight is your like, okay, eight and fine, but ten is like really pushing it, ten. If it's fifty, then it's fifty. That's real staka. Because what does it say about Eliyahu Navi? Hashem says about the ravens that he commanded the ravens to feed Eliyahu. Why the raven? Because the raven is the most cruel animal. It says about a person who wants to study Torah, a person who wants to fulfill the Torah, that where does the Torah meet Kayen by? Who is the Torah? Where is the Torah sustained by? One who blackens his face like a, like a raven. Meaning what? He has to be cruel in the Torah. He has to literally kill himself. When I say kill yourself, Rabenu doesn't say, Rabenu says it's not good to be a fanatic. You don't need to be a fanatic to be an ish to be an upright Jew. You don't need to be fanatic. But what does it mean to be a fanatic? You have to be, you have to be strong. You have to have azut. You have to go into it and you cannot stop. If your mother and your father are the ones distracting you from Avodat Hashem, then it means take more. I'm talking about real Avodat Hashem. If they're telling you to, to go take out the trash and you're not down, that's not, that, that's not, uh, that's not distracting from Avodat Hashem. That's Kibbut Devayim. The only time Kibbut Devayim is not in play is the second they're distracting you from the, the, the Avodat Hashem. For example, they're trying to prevent you from traveling to the Tzadik. You, you shouldn't listen to them. Lefi Rabbein. Now that's a very difficult thing to explain. Why? Because it meant you think Okay, the parents are final word, you know? You owe them so you owe them everything. But you don't realize is that when you're doing the Tashem, you're giving them more. <laughs> of course there's lots of depth to this. But I'm saying anyone that prevents you from this, whether it's your father in law, whether it's your brother, whether it's yourself preventing you. You have to blacken yourself like an oven, like a raven, and turn that cruelty into azud in a sense. So Rabbeinu is saying, Staka, specifically to break the cruelty. Why? Because everyone's nature is to keep their money. You know the sacrifice a person puts in their life to get a dollar? You know the blood and the sweat. Rabbeinu literally says the blood and the sweat that you literally, that you literally draw out of yourself to get a dollar. Rabbeinu says you have to be very makpi not to do that. One time one of his students came to him and uh, he lost money for the second time. Rabbeinu said, what are you doing? You spent so much time going to work to lose time of Torah and Mitzvot. And now, when you go there, you, you're like mizarzer all your money. You, you, you almost like don't care. You mock the money like you don't care about your pockets. Rabbeinu said you have to make sure your pockets are sold properly. If you have a garment that doesn't have a proper pocket, that's on you that, you're, that you lost your money. Because you're already spending so much time to get the money already that drains your energy from studying Torah. You already lose so many hours a day. Mitzvot, ma'asim tovim, avodat Hashem. Why? Because you went to go earn a panasah. So Rabbeinu saying, keep it very careful. You know what I mean? Guard your money very, very tight. Because that money has an incredible amount of mitzvot. Of course, you went to do belu and mitzvot. You go to work, you retrieve those sparks from that place. But be careful when, you're, when you have your money. Rabbeinu says, with tzedakado, give. And break the cruelty. Of course, each and every person knows to that degree. And you have to do that with a balance. You cannot just give everything unless you have that bitachon to give everything. The Bar Shem Tov. Bar Shem Tov, every single night before you used to go to bed, he used to give all his money 
so that the next day Hashem Yibach could provide a completely new parnasa. He did not go to bed with one single coin in his pocket. Not one. Not in his house. The Barashat used to come home to his, uh, what do you call it, his wife. And one night, he found his wife uh, cooking, uh, so what do you call it? He found his wife cooking. He thought it was for the meal or whatever, dinner. Barashat was distracted, whatever you. Later he went to bed that night, and he can't sleep. Barashat can't sleep, he's turning in his bed for however long. He goes to his wife and he says, did you leave something in the house? Money? She said, no, not money, but I cooked something for tomorrow. He said, what are you talking about cooking something for tomorrow? Mm. He gave it to a poor person. And then, then he was able to sleep. Why? Because even the food that was cooked for tomorrow was not in an offering. That's Bar Shem Tov. Rabbeinu says that a person should strive to get to that level. A person should strive to get to that level. But if he does not have 100% bitachon, it does not work. He has to have 100%. When you have 100%, you know it. If you're not sure, then you don't really have it at all. If you know it, you'll have 100% bitachon. Every single day, you'll give all your money for tzedakah, and then you'll go uh, tomorrow, brand new thing. There are, there are, I don't know if there's people today that can do this. I'm sure there are, that we don't know about. But it's um, a very high level. And of course, there's an even higher level than that, which is to keep the money. That's for only the true tzaddik. The true tzaddik is at a level where he has all the money, and still, and still instead of giving it, he keeps it, which is even higher. Of course, he gets stuck up, but to keep the money, which has all these rectifications with it, in your possession is much harder. Because a person, when he has so much money, he can change himself. Anytime you give someone money, they change immediately. You become a brand new person, you act differently with the more money you have. With a true tzaddik, he doesn't act like that at all. He stays the same person. So the more money the tzaddik collects, the more rectification he's able to accomplish. Which is why Abenu says in Lesson 60 that a person can attain Hidbonanut and Torah, a, 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 a perception or a Hidbonanut. It's almost an analysis and a. Uh, what's the right word for Hidbonanut? You know Rabbi Adas in the Kotel? Of course. He comes from a very wealthy family. He does? He does. Wow. And he walks around with torn pants. Mm -hmm. This is a guy, I'm sure if you guys went to the Kotel with a big bottle of water. I was just and, there. I saw him. for every fila. I mean, it, to stand next to him in the fila is like, look, you feel fire, electricity. Right. He's the same way. He doesn't keep anything. Even everything. All the way. Yeah. So you see, by the way, that is 100% possible. You have to then remind yourself to do it. So Rabbeinu says, there are pathways of the Torah that have a tremendous amount of contemplation behind it, understanding behind it, levels and gates that you would not be able to attain whatsoever unless you do this one, unless you do this one thing. It's only possible to get to that contemplation of the Torah by means of Ashirut wealth. And the true tzaddik, this is why Rabbi Nachman says, I say three things contrary to the world. I mean, this is on Lesson 60. At the end of Lesson 60, he said these three things. One, I say that Sipurim um, Asiyot wakes people up, whereas the world says that stories put people to sleep. The second thing is that people say stories make women barren, make women not have children. But I say that my stories are able to give women this Pekidut, this pekidut Akarot, essentially they, this special providence to make barren women be able to have children. Very big Sigura. You, want, you know a woman who can't, who can't uh, have a child? Give her Sipur HaMasyot. It's incredible, the, the miracle, the stories. Third thing, I say, the world says, that the true tzaddik, or the tzaddik doesn't need any money. For If he's such a tzaddik, why does he need money? But I say that the true tzaddik needs all the money in the world. That's the third thing. Why? Because he's able to take the contemplation and bring in a hit bonanut to the Torah that was impossible except through Hashirot. Which is why Rabbi Udanasi, Moshe Rabbeinu, Yisachar, all these great tzaddikim in the past all had tremendous amount of money. Avraham Abinu, Yitzchak, Yaakov. Spot on. Why? Because there's a level of Torah. And by the way, this we can all see personally. If you're stuck not earning a panasa, you're not able to understand the Torah at a, at a level that a person who goes to work is able to after because he has a yeshuvah with the money. 
Meaning what? When you earn a certain amount of parnasa, it gives you Yeshua that a settled mind so that when you enter the Torah, you're able to attain a new gate of the Torah. It's very unique stuff, of course. Mm. Very interesting also. A lot of the time you see people who study all day, of course, you know what I mean? They have more access to it. But there's, there's gates and there's levels and, you know what I mean, pathways that are only accessible to people who have money. That's why Panasana actually can be used for a tremendous amount of Kedusha. But we go back to the lesson, Staka. Staka is the entire reason why we go to work. Which is why Rabbeinu says, the only intention and kabana with every single step you take out at work, every single dibu you have at work, every single word you have at work, every single conversation, any single thing you do at work has to have the kabana behind it that every single money, any single dollar you'll make, you'll want to give tzaka for. That's the kabana. That every single time you go to work, from the morning, from the second you get up to the end of the day when you get back home, your entire kabana should be to give tzaka. Rabbeinu says that does the entire tikkun for your work. Tzaka. That's your entire intention, your kamara. So let's go to Likute and Sotan Bo'awak, Rabbi Nachman's great grandson. Um, uh, wrote a sefer called Etzotan Bo'awak. No, no, go, go. Just to clarify, she was saying that every step should be in the Kuzumi Is that in reference to Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, look, Maser is the bare minimum. That's halakha according to the Torah. Is that considered staka? Absolutely. Of course, you're giving charity to someone. But, it's a mitzvah in the Torah. The second staka is interesting, though, is that there's no amount the Torah gives you to give staka. There's no amount the Torah tells you to give staka. Of course, it's the Maser, but after that, the Torah doesn't say anything. You can give according to how much you have emunah. Now, when you earn that money, of course, the bare minimum, 10% of your paycheck or whatever it is, goes after, of course, you know what I mean? Whatever you net profit, uh, for example. But, all the money afterwards, imagine going to work and not having Kavana just to give 10%, but what about the 90%? So with regard to the 90%, the 10% is already covered, right? Because you know you're going to work, you're going to get Masa. But the other 90, have to have the Kavana when you go to work. The other 90%, I'm trying not to profit from it as much. That all the work I go through, that all the profit I go earn, let me give that to others. Tamtel right to support people study Torah. There's a balance between the two. I mean, also if you put your kids in a good form school, of course, that's that's that. of course. You know, you, you make sure you're helping, uh, uh, you know, family members uh, <coughs> with, with something they need. That's it's that kind. Of course. I mean, obviously the outside is, is better. It says. First, you're right, absolutely, no, 100%, 100%. Education for the kids, most important thing. You know, that's of course, considered. It says, sorry. No, 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 it says, it says it's covered already. It says it's part of the Panasa, I think it says in the big Yeah, but the child is born, right. Yeah, it says, it says that, it says like, I think uh, Hashem has like a reserve bank account, but according to him, we're not. Mm -hmm. uh, I think food for Shabbat. And you're like uh, you should not for like your son, but the uh, Mufashim say your daughter also. Right. Wow. So, yeah, it's a great like, Gemara Beitza. We went to the other. That's awesome. So yeah, he says. So what Gemara is that? Beitza. Beitza. Yeah, the beginning. Beginning. I don't know what. Very nice. Okay. So so this is like as long as someone has a, someone is giving, has an intention to give. Of course. And like every step that he does, I mean every action that he does within that uh, work environment is. It's spot on. Right? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's incredible. Rabbeinu says this as a piece of advice for going to work. The entire Kavanah is in Zaka. You know? It's, uh, that's, the, that's the entire back of our head should be running. Rabbeinu says, your work, your work, your work ethic, of course, the outer side, the Chitzioniyut to Machshava, the Chitzioniyut part of your mind, the outer aspect of your mind has to be engaged in the work itself, right? When you're cooking, of course, you need to use your, you know what I mean, the front part of your mind, essentially to understand what seasoning goes in this sauce for the client that's about to order a plate of pasta. I'm giving you an example. Or the numbers that you need to run at your office. But the pnimiyuta mahshaba, which is the inner kavana of your mind, there's always two things. You can always have both of them. The pnimiyuta has to be engaged in staka and in Torah and Avodat Hashem. That what? That when you're going to work, you should be thinking about Hashem in the middle of your work. That what? But the chitzoniyut, when you're calling a client, 
Okay, of course, you have to think with your brain about how you're going to speak to this client, which strategy to use. But the inner part is all the kavana. That's like the, the, the nishama of the goof. The goof is providing, okay, doing all the basic necessities of your work. You know, the basic thing that you need to do that logically makes sense. You're giving someone a call for sales, this and that. Okay, you have to pitch yourself. But, primiyut ha-machshavad, it's like the nishama. It gives the entire life to the body of what you're doing. That gives the entire kavana, the, that gives the beauty and the, the yofi of the work that you do. So that when you go to work now, it's in Avodat Hashem. Can you imagine? A person studies Torah all day, but a person has the ability to bring the Torah to the work. You know how, you know how to love, what level a person can, like a, a level a person can be at to do that? It's incredible. To literally go to work and to bring Hashem in that place. That's literally the only reason why we're created. The only reason that Hashem wants us to praise Him from the, the Choshech. And what's Choshech? There's no more Choshech than work. Choshech is, work is the biggest Choshech. It's really Esav. So you have to go to Esav and find the Nitzot. And the spark from there. So Rabbeinu says like this. We see this in, uh, in Nikudah Moran, lesson 2, from Nikudah Etzot. A person needs to separate Tzedakah before he prays. Prayer, we talked about earlier, is a sword. And you have to understand how to use this weapon. You cannot strike the sword too much to the right or too much to the left. Because you need to use it in the proper place. When you use a weapon, make sure you're going to use it properly. When you're going to shoot a gun, make sure you hit the target. So what? Rabbanu says, it's not too much to the right or too much to the left. The commentaries explain, the Oral Kutin brings it down, and the Pavel Nechomachman brings it down in the name of Rabbi Nathan from Nikut Elachot, Yechot Nechalot. That what? There's two types of klipot, the right and the left. Esav and Ishmael. Esav is what? Left side team. What's the idea of the left side? Look what he says here. <clears throat> Let me just find it. I think it's actually in here, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. That you shouldn't lean too much to the right or too much to the left. What does it mean to lean too much to the left? That you shouldn't think your tefillot are not effective. That's Esav. The inyan of Esav, they don't pray. Look at the Christians today. Mm. When do you see them pray? The, the Arabs pray. Pray five times a day. The Christians, what do they do? Maybe they have one tefillah, I don't know. It's definitely not as much as the Muslim, not as much as us. Especially if a person is doing it, but they don't even compare. That's one inyan. That's too much to the left. That's the inyan of Tipab Esav. Which means what? You think your tefillot are not effective. What are you going to pray for? What's the point? You don't think your tefillot are being listened to. Second thing, the second klipa is the klipa of the right side, which is Ishmael. What does that mean? That you shouldn't think you shouldn't think that you can rely on Hashem's chesed and that you don't need to pray at all. Which means what? The klipa of Esav is that you don't think your tefillot are effective. So what's the point of praying? The klipa of Ishmael is that what? Hashem is complete chesed. So what's the point of praying? That's the inyan of Ishmael. Because it's to the right side. Ishmael represents the inyan of Yamin. Esav represents the left. Esav is din, Ishmael is chesed. But what's Ishmael? Ishmael is this inyan. That what? The right side. And what's the right? Leaning too much to chesed. I'm going to rely on Hashem's chesed and not pray. What's the point? He already knows what I'm going to say. Rabbi Nur says you should not think like that at all. This represents a klipa of Ishmael. Because the truth is this. That you, continue, you need to continue praying until you leave your guidance. Rabbi Nachman says, when you think you start praying, when you start praying, and you begin to see a spark of Yeshua's salvation, you begin to see as things are slowly start, to fall in, start falling into place. Rabbi Nachman says, the biggest Yitzhak has to stop praying. You have to continue until the Yeshua is finished. Until the Yeshua, the salvation is completely sealed. You know, if you're praying for a car, for example, you need a car to go to work. You do not stop praying until you get to the car. Not whenever you, uh, what do you call it? You sign the paper. You continue praying until the car arrives in your driveway. The same is true of everything. You want to pray to get to Uman or you want to pray to go to Eretz Yisrael to go visit the Kotel. You do not pray until you get in the land. The second you book your ticket, is not enough. Yitzhak is too big for that and we know it. Yitzhak will try to convince a person, okay, you booked your ticket. Wait till the last second. There's, there's, a, Yitzha, there's a war. <coughs> the news, the media, the this and that. Everything. The Yitzhah is very good at his job. You're not there 
You, you don't stop praying until you're there. You're engaged, you don't stop praying until you're married. And when you're married, you don't stop praying until the Asha Abayat. It never stops, Tfilah. Tfilah is a never ending game. Never ending. Tfilah is the infinite. It's Eden Ayn Nora'ata. Why is Tfilah compared to Eden and Torah is compared to the Gan? Torah is compared to the garden, but Tfilah is compared to Eden. Eden is higher than the Gan. I mean, Nachman brings this down in Sihot Aran, in 75, to teach us that a certain level of tefillah is higher than Limut Torah. Which level of tefillah? When you're praying for Ruchaniyot, when you're praying for spiritual things. When you pray to Hashem Ibaq saying, you're not praying for a car anymore. Of course, it's the level of praying for the car, but asking Hashem Ibaq to give you a car so that you can actually do chesed, right? That's a level that's equal to Tamil Torah. When you pray for gash, things that are Gashmut, physical, but for the purpose of spiritual, right? Hashem, help me have a panasah so I can buy a table for Shabbat. That's equal to Talmud Torah. But there's a level of tefillah that goes higher than everything else. And what is that? Hashem, I want to be an upright Jew. That can you do your T.U.D.? Help me be a Jew. Help me be a Jew, a simple Jew. Help me be a Jew. Rabbi Nathan once heard of Rabbeinu from his chambers doing his bodilut. That can you do your T.U.D.? Help me merit to be a Jew. Rabbi Nathan. How many merit to be a Jew? You're going back to the ultimate first level. How many merit to be a Jew? There's nothing higher than a Jew. The Jew is the ultimate thing. Shiro asani goi. The no meli menech. The no meli menech used to do chatzot. He used to get up from chatzot. You know what he used to do at chatzot? He used to bang his head on the wall and start crying over the fact that he's the one who destroyed the temple. No meli menech. Rabbi Eli menech mini We don't even know the no meli menech. Rabbi Nachman said about the no meli menech that his sefer, the Noam al does not even give us a description of how big this, this tzaddik is. His book doesn't even give us an indication of how big he is. Rabbi Nachman said that about one sefer, Noam al He said that about maybe one or two others found him. The Noam al His book doesn't even tell us that. Anyone who reads his book is blown away by the, by the inyanim that are brought there. So what? The Noam al used to cry a chatzosh, but you can see this with the temple. Until he had the mirror to say Shiloh as and he used to lift, him, lift himself up in Simcha. Thank you, Hashem Bach, for not making me a Gentile. Thank you for making me a Jew. That in itself was enough to console him. That's the ultimate consolation for all of us. No matter how low you fall, you always have the Neshama. Of course, that's the, you know what I mean? That's the, that's the Shorish of everyone. And that, that's the most important thing a person has. Even if you find nothing, the Indian that you have a neshama, that you're a Jew. That is, that's, that's enough to supply the entire world. So Rabbeinu continues, going back to this um, idea. Uh, uh, I interrupt you before, so can you uh, yeah, finish the thought earlier? You said this is a safer of his grandson that he published? Oh yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're going to uh, Etot Amvorot. Etot Amvorot is uh, Rav Shim Shon Barsky, who's Rabbi Nachman's great grandson. Um, his book on Likud Etzot. So it gives a better, not a better, it gives us a more in-depth explanation about certain concepts in the Kutei Tzot, that Rabbi Nathan wrote, more in-depth, different Inyanim that we didn't have access to, that, uh, of course, he had tradition from Rabbi Nathan. He's you buried know. next to the yes. ceiling up there, right? Exactly, he's buried in the old cemetery, uh, the, the, the cemetery in Uman, like whenever up you go. Up the hills? Exactly, up the hills. Yeah, I think I do. Um, exactly. Um, so... He's over there. Look what he says here. I think it's here, if I'm not mistaken. Ali did tzedaka, amitit, he says. Through tzedaka, when you give tzedaka through truth. What does that mean through truth? Through truth. Not to give tzedaka for the sake of honor and for pride. The only reason why you give tzedaka is because Hashem said so. We're going back to the basic. Why am I doing this? Because Hashem said to do it. I don't know why. Even the fact that it makes the poor person happy, it doesn't matter. I'm doing it because Hashem said so. Now, making the poor person happy is another thing on top of that. But because Hashem said so, that's the idea of tzaka. Utzaka zo yeshatet la'anim agonim. And this tzaka you need to give to a person who's proper. True, proper poor people. Not a person who's going to go use a tzaka for shtuyot. And you know it already before you give it. These are the people who fear Hashem truthfully. 
או לעניינים אחרים שהם לתכלית טובה אמיתית, או to other ideas and for example programs whatever it is, which is for the purpose of something very true and good. כגון להדפסת ספרי צדיקים, for example, to print a book of צדיקים, הפצה, to give money to people, to give books to people. Rabbi Nathan says there's no bigger stakah than this. That they give money for the books. Sorry. It is the highest stakah. For the books. Huh? For the books. Meaning what? To give money for books, to buy a book, to give it to someone. The inyan of tshuva, what stands in, what stands in, what's bigger than tshuva? You give for to, food to a person, you sustain him physically. Of course, that's necessary. That's basic necessary. But the inyan of stakah, when you give to printing the books, that stakah is immediately Rabbi Nachman says, Staka that you give to the true tzaddik is as if you take a seed and you plant it in the earth. Immediately you're going to, see, you're going to reap the benefits. Whereas other tzaddikah, you don't give tzaddikah to another poor person. Tzaddikah, the coins of money which represent the seed, is being brought to someone who doesn't have the vessel to accept it. If it's not to the pro- proper person. God forbid you see someone at 7-Eleven who's uh, about to go across the street and go buy another cigarette or something like that. And he knows tzaddikah is not tzaddikah. Now of course... We have to do it because there's the idea of Chilul uh, Hashem. You know, you give staka to people like that. But the main staka that we give our money to, of course you give them a, a few bucks here or there whenever you see that. The main staka that we do that we're, in, that we're influenced by, that we're, uh, what do you call it, that, we're, that we have passion for, is that staka that we're talking about with, with uh, Yireh Hashem, people who need the money who don't have to eat that are, you know what I mean, that serve Hashem or to give money to the book, or to do a donation to, Whatever it is, for the honor of Hashem. Anything for the honor of Hashem. That what? That this staka will awaken a person's heart to serve Hashem and to fulfill the Torah. That staka, this staka, the money for to give staka to poor, proper people who, who fear Hashem, this is the ultimate staka. <coughs> So this is the Indian of Tzaka, just a little bit. I want to go to this idea right here. Anyone have any questions? Okay. So it's funny, Rabbi Nachman, of course, brings it down in the name of Shulchan Aruch to give three coins to charity at Vayibat David, at Bakor. Right. Now this Indian has a lot of significance in the soul. When you say, uh, what do you call it, Bakor? That Moshe Bakor, you give two coins, and then you wait a second, and you give an extra a third coin. This is the way of the Ariza, the Ariza taught it like this. The same, he used to do it before Mincha also. But, Rabbi was giving us an extra here. He says, Lifnat Fila, before it's Fila. And Rabbeinu says in Lesson 25 that the way to subdue the Koach HaMedame, the way to subdue the strength of the imagination, all your tabot, your fantasies, is when you give tzedakah before Hodu. You know when you start Kobanot, you give Kobanot, you do Yehudah uh, Metam and then you do Shetiv Nebet Amidash. After that, you give tzedakah right before Hodu. Why? Because significance, according to the soul, brought down in Shara Kabanot, that you're traveling from the world of Asiya to the world of Yetzirah when you start Hodu. The lowest world, the world of Asya, is the Korbanot. It's the sacrifices that we say before we even start Odu. When we do the first Shema, when we say, uh, the, uh, what do you call it? Aket all that stuff, is all world of Asya. The Birkot HaShachar, all the world of Asya. The second you start Odu is the second you enter the world of Yetzira. And in the world of Yetzira is the world of Sechel. So what does Rabbanu say? When you enter the world of Sechel, how do you subdue it? Staka. Which is what? Dulot Aboreh. That's the greatness of Hashem. You want to know the greatness of Hashem? Is tzedaka because when you give tzedaka, you're illuminating Hashem's colors, which is what the sefirot of Hashem, the attributes of Hashem. When you give tzedaka, tzedaka possesses all the gvanim that mean all the supernal colors. When you give tzedaka, there's nothing bigger than this. Give it before Hodu, your words have grace now. To what Rabbeinu was saying here, that the second you pray, you need to have, you need to pray with an inyan of mishpat. But how do you attain mishpat? Tzedaka. Specifically by, by giving staka is the essence of mishpat. That's how you take mishpat. By hope, 
that, that, that's my fourth fila, exactly, by Hodu. Uh, to clarify, I know, I know because they say you know, Hodu is connected to um, Roshama, but as I've seen the many Sidurim, correct me if I'm wrong, I've seen the many Sidurim which is by, by Roshama, is, 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 it, is it the preparation from Hodu? Or what um, is it it is... I'll tell you, let's look at lesson 25 right now. You're right. Because also, I mean, I could be wrong, but I think, um, uh, I think the Ben Shabbat brings down that the uh, Hashem Malach, Hashem Malach, Hashem Malach, Hashem Malach, is that it is healed in the world of Asiya. Interesting. So, so um, no, no, that's like God of the Day. No, no, you, you actually might be absolutely right. By what, um, it's, good you, it's good you mentioned that. Let's see. Ah, you're right. So look what it says here. It's impossible to subdue the klipot. It's impossible the Meaning what? It's impossible to subdue all these illusions, these thoughts, these desires, these confusions, these obstacles at, at the new level which you're trying to reach. Because a Jew is always going from level to level. So the new level that you're at for example, you're going to hit the roof of this building, that becomes the floor of the next, the next level. The roof, though, is level 10 of the level you're in right now. When you hit that roof, though, and you break the roof, you get to level 1 of the, the next stage. So what? Rabban was saying, to break all those ta'avot, those dimino, those confusions which you hit at the roof of your level, because the second you reach the potential of one level, you're attacked by the klipa. Why? Because you're about to reach the new one. So the Yitzhak is going to try to subdue you. Rabbanu says you need to reinforce yourself against the Yitzhah. How do you do that? The only way to do that is through Gdura Tabor, the greatness of Hashem, the greatness of the Creator, by channeling in Hashem's Gdura. What does that mean? Kamuva ba kavanot, shel hodu l'Hashem ki obishmo, it's brought down in the kavanot of the Arizal, hodu l'Hashem ki obishmo, the first Mizmor we say at the beginning of the Tula, essentially. Shezea Mizmor nitkan l'achmi ha-klipot shebe Yitzhah. So exactly, you're right, it's not the world of Yitzhah. But it was established to subdue the klipot which were about to enter Yitzhah, which starts about Shana. So, well said, spot on. So, that, I, yeah, so it all fits. Like, I'm sure it did, but thank you for. No, you're right. You're absolutely it's, right. It's in, like you're saying, it's the roof, but it's the words of the next level. Exactly. I'm explain the condition in between because, as we know, the condition is usually the stepping stone between each. each uh, Very each, nice. Uh, well, well, no. yes, nice. Right. Very nice. So, that, spot on. You're 100% right. So, when do we give it second? Before Hodu. Oh, before still, before. still before Hodu. Just the Indian of Hodu is there as a, as a gateway to break that level, which you're about to enter in Yitzhira. Hodu is the, is the pathway to Yitzhira. Can you do it once you walk in? What? Like in the morning. Just keep the civil up right at that time. Right before Hodu, you're saying? You're right when you walk in. Like, yeah, before Hodu. Yeah, of course. As long as it's before Hodu. When you do Kobanot, before you start Hodu, that's the time. If it takes 20 minutes for you to start going, not then go to Hodu. Okay. Rizal says there's one more place you should always have three coins, hopefully of equal value, three dimes, quarters is best. And it says, when you get up to say, Rebalch Tabi, at the point of Rebalch Tabi, Chal Mahi Gidla, but what the principal hold, you put two, and then you take the one after that. It gets into the whole, it's, uh, Related to Rachel, the Le'ah, the Le'ah, the three fruit thoughts is something that is very high in the level of meaning. Of course. Before, and it's right before when you do Shabbat to get to Shema. Very nice. So we, we are three coins by Valdavid, Bakol, and then before Hodu. And the Inan of before Hodu, Rabbi Nachman explains here. We all have Tavot here, we all have Bilburim, we all have Dimunot, we all have Mashabot Zahov. The only way to destroy it though, is what? Gdurot Abogit, Saka, exactly. And the way to do that specifically is Hodu. Because Hodu is the channel to break that Klipa. If I may just add one more point. Uh -huh. It's interesting both by Ashkenazi and by Sephardi, uh, it's in two different places Hodu, but they both within that part. Now, Ashkenazi is called Asdor Shemar than Hodu, but they're at the entrance of the Bits. Very interesting. Whereas, um, as we know by Sephardi, Tavani and Hodu is before this, but Roshan Mark is like more of a set, you know, like a, a build up to where it's still at the entrance, at the beginning of, of Rosh Hashanah. So I mean, I'll, I'
So when you give tzedaka to an ani hagun, that's the essence of Hashem's greatness and His pride. So we continue back into the subject. I want to get back into the sinyan of, uh, what do you call it? Of, uh, of Likut Arachot. Ki ikul ha-mishpat nimshach mechamat she'en ma'aminim be'ishchad da'chei Hashem. Rabbi Nachman teaches us like this. Um, wait a second. <clears throat> Before that, I want to get to this thing, which is the most important way of giving tzedaka. Look how Rabbi Nathan says to give tzedaka. In Gviyat Milve Halacha, Likut Halachot, look what he says here. Uvehemet im nasim hadam libo vedato hetev behemet namito. Veiskor hetev et kol advarim ha'el veyotam mizeh bevadai. Iten tzedaka harbe mishte yadayim vesever panim yafot. Uv simcha rabba. Velo yera lebavo klal betito lehaevion. Rabbi Nathan says, if you pay attention to the words that we're saying about staka, the greatness of giving staka, it is certain that you're going to give staka a lot of it with both of your hands. First thing, first thing out of staka. A lot of people say give with one hand. Even according to the sod, does he need not to give the right hand? Rabbi Nathan says no, two hands. Why? Because Rabbi Nathan teaches us in lesson four of the Kuten Antinyana. The entire Yana staka is to break your Azuriyot, which is your deen of your left hand. So use the deen of the left hand and give the staka with both. And the Inyan of giving staka with both hands, Rabbi Nathan brings it down as psa. Two hands when you give staka. Second thing, Besel of Panim Yafot, you have to be smiling when you give staka. There's an entire idea of staka in lesson 31 that Abel mentions, Abel Yafot Moran, where he discusses different types of staka and different blessings to receive. There's six blessings for a person who gives staka. There's 11 blessings for a person who gives staka, Besel of Panim Yafot. With uh, what do you call it? Hamfai Sobi Barak, who appeases a, a, for a person with his words, who gives him consolation. Eleven Barakot. That's set, that's five more than the than the initial. So Rabbeinu says, <coughs> uh, Rabbi Nathan says, both hands, sever panim yafot, giving him a good face, a pleasant face, smiling. Simcha Rabba, with simcha. Velo yagal lebavok klal betito leadon. You shouldn't create an evil heart when you give to the Barakot. You shouldn't be. Uh, what they say in French, you shouldn't be like, uh, like I'm not down. You shouldn't be saying that. I'm not interested in giving it back. I'm doing it, okay. Get yourself in the mood. Get yourself in the mood. Do a dance and give tzaka. Be besimcha. Ki yadun she'en no natin klal le'ani. Adraba. Hakol she'er Hashem itbarach. Because when you have emuna, you'll understand like this. That you are not giving a poor person money. Hashem itbarach is giving you everything. And you are just giving everything that Hashem gave you. You're giving it back. You're giving it back. It's not even yours. So Rabbeinu says, Rabbi Nathan says like this, Rak Hashem itbarach chaman velo hirbid alav latet arba charakim le'ani v'chelik mechom eshlo. It's just that Hashem itbarach has so much compassion that He didn't make it so heavy on you, what? That He didn't give the poor person four-fifths of your wealth and you take one. He said, you have the decision to give him one. And you take four. That's Hashem's chesed. On top of that, Rabbeinu teaches us that the brother in the Gemara, yoter more than that which the, what do you call it, than that which the person, the Barabite, gives to the Ani, the Ani is doing to the Barabite. The Tzedakah, the, the, the Ani, the poor person is doing when he's receiving the money is greater than the act of giving the Tzedakah. Bigger than the act of giving the Tzedakah is when the Ani accepts it. Because he's giving you the opportunity to attain all those things. And on top of that, on top of that, Rabbi Nathan says in Nikut Arachot, when Hashem Ibarach is besimcha with one of his people, with one of his uh, children, he sends him a poor person to the door to ask for money. So imagine, when a person comes to your door for money, Hashem Ibarach is showing you I'm happy with your Avodat Hashem. When you walk across someone, he pulls out that credit card thing, to swipe with the Venmo, he's happy. You actually create your table of okay? faith. I think that's a is the money in the coin. The hay is your hand holding it. The bum is when you extend it. Okay? And the hay is the receiving hand. Wow. So you create you give up him. This is why it's also very important to hand the person. Don't put the money down. If you're giving money to Saka, hand it to their hand. Awesome. And you create you give up hey, at every single time you do that. So you have to start running after them. They shouldn't really have to go after them to get And the most, you know what's even higher? This is something that blows your mind that Ali Zara says. 
of, of the money you have and any possession. He says, your children are not yours. They are picadon from Hashem. So don't treat them as a rachush. Wow. They are picadon from Hashem. This is why, in, in fact, in Hitzor uh, Shulchanolok, uh, he says, when you come to Bet Knesset and you bring your child, don't kiss him. him yeah. Don't kiss him in Bet Knesset. Don't hug him in Bet Knesset. Is yours, huh? Okay, no. He came here for home. Wow. That's crazy. Incredible. Wow. Chazak. That's, that's awesome. <laughs> So look at this. Rabbi Anu says like this. Rabbi Nathan says in Nikud Alachot Gerim, Hilchot Gerim. Tzion be Mishpat Tipade. Tzion will be redeemed to Mishpat, to justice. Ikar Churban Bet Hamidash Ayal Kilkul Hamishpat. The main reason why the Bet Hamidash was destroyed was because of a damage in Mishpat. Justice. We just talked about it, the idea of Tzadka and its root. כמובן בדיברי אבותינו דמונחד, החכמים say, שיקח חורבן ירושלים היה על שבעיתו בה את הדין. Why did they destroy it? Why was ירושלים destroyed? Because they made judgment crooked. What does that mean? They didn't give the deen the way it was supposed to be given. The law itself wasn't, wasn't there was no, the psak wasn't proper. They evto the deen, they made the deen crooked. Which means what? Mishpat. There was a, bina, there was a damage in Mishpat. Mishpat means justice. They did the exact opposite. Okay? So look what Rabbi Nathan says. כמו שכתוב, ולצד ההופכים לענם, ללענם משפט וכו'. וכחצי בזה בסוגים הרבה המדברים מגלות ישראל, וחורבן בית המקדש שנזכר בהם קלקול המשפט, שבשביל זה חורבן ירושלים. So it discusses all these פסוקים, which talk about the destruction in ירושלים, simply because there was a damage in משפט. כי שם בבית המקדש היו יושבים סנהדרי גדולה בלשכת הגזית, שמשם היה יוצא משפט לכל העולם. ואין לבית המקדש, אין ללשכת הגזית, אין לנו על השם הזה, לשכת הגזית. It was a certain area in the Beit HaMikdash. That was essentially... Huh? Exactly. And that's where the Sanhedrin used to give out the Pesach. I forget the, the immediate translation of that. And from there, the Mishpat went out to the entire world. From that place in the Beit HaMikdash. V'l'atid l'avo ikar b'inan Yerushalayim yi al de Mishpat. And in the future, Mishpat will be the way that it's rebuilt. Because we fall into Mishpat. But the way to rebuild it is through Mishpat. Like it says, Tzion be Mishpat Tipadeh. Tzion will be redeemed to Mishpat. Yerushalayim will be redeemed to Mishpat. Which means what? Simply through Tzataka and through the other Inyanim, which of course mean Mishpat. A good example of Mishpat, judging yourself over everything you do. That's Mishpat. It says, Mishpat is the seat of the great Sanhedrin during the second temple period. Located on the Temple Mount. Wow, okay. Exactly like we, we said. The exact Hazard. transition is Chamber of Human, H-E-W-N, Stone. Chamber of Human Stone. Interesting. Uh, it didn't, didn't ring anything for me. <laughs> 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 but nonetheless, I guess we get the idea. Yeah. So this is that. That Mishpat is going to be the way we build it. So Rabbeinu says here, what's the Yitzhak Yana Mishpat? The way to actually manifest Mishpat is Tzaka. We have to give more Tzaka. When we go to work, we have to be more open to giving Tzaka. It's a huge thing that we have the opportunity to do in this world that is one of the biggest mitzvot of all the mitzvot. We'll be so jealous once we leave this world, we'll be so envious of the fact that people have the ability to give Tzaka. It's, it's mind-boggling, the, the mitzvah that we do when we give Tzaka. You know? Uh, who understands this idea? Of uh, Tzaka, Rabbi says, yeah. Just to give us a little bit more chizuk on it, maybe, and then we'll stop. Let's all move on. <clears throat> uh, so Rabbi says here, like this: <laughs> to transform that cruelty of yours and to turn it into compassion. That's the essence of Tzaka. As long as you still have your, as long as you still didn't transform that quality, it's not the main idea of tzaka. Tzaka, but it's not the main idea of tzaka. So Rabbi Nachman continues. 
Um, <clears throat> the beginning of tzedakah is kasher v'edamot. It's very difficult to give tzedakah. Extremely difficult to start giving. Because all the acts of service that you want to do, all the tshuva that you want to do, any single thing that you want to do to serve Hashem Yibbaah, how many screams do you have to do before you begin accomplishing it? Anything that you want to start accomplishing. You want to start going to the mikveh. You know how much you have to work on yourself to beg Hashem to start crying to go to the mikveh? To wake up chatzot? I can't even imagine how many tfilot it requires to wake up chatzot. Break your tavot. So, Rabbanu says that what? Kama genichot. Kama kalin she ol vavoy. Kama kfilut vechama hatayot. How many gestures? Kfilut. Whatever the, uh, this, I, this word is which represents this idea of sighing. These groans that you have to do, these screams that you have to do, the oiva voice that you have to do before you accomplish a certain act in Kedusha. Why? All beginnings are difficult. Everything. This we know. A beginning represents an ext- going from one extreme to the next. When you start something for the first time, you are changing a habit. And changing a habit is very difficult. You want to start going to work, changing your hours? It's going to be extreme at the beginning because you are not in that state. You're not in that structure yet. Every beginning is difficult because the beginning represents a complete shift. So Rabbi Nachman teaches us that what? Meaning all these gestures that we do before we want to accomplish any Abodat Hashem, it requires so many, right? But the main thing is the way we start it. Because the start determines the finish. The start determines the rest. The way you start the track will determine how you finish the track. The start is the most important thing. She ask Hashemel that the start is the most difficult. So how do you break open the start? I mean, Nachman says, Tzedakah. Tzedakah is the way to break it open. That all the, the openings are open, everything, all the gates are open, the, the beginnings are made easier through Tzedakah. Because all the beginnings have to come from Tzedakah. When you want to start something new, Tzedakah. Anytime there's a shift in something new, a Hadchala beginning, Tzedakah. This is the, the ultimate thing. To give tzedakah, to give tzedakah. And with that, kol ha to be generous of the heart. That's what it means. Nedivut, to have generosity. It means to transform that cruelty into nedivut. To be generous. So that's each and every person according to where he stands, how much he possesses. Each and every person. I'll finish off with a story. Rabbi Nathan Atar Rabbeinu passed away. He was trying to build the Khloi Zenuma. The Khloi is the shul where they were trying to organize all the Tzilot for Rosh Hashanah because by Rabbi Nachman's Kevra, there was no space. So, a few, uh, whatever, a few walk, minutes walk down, they wanted to build a shul in Uman. For when people, all the Hasidim used to come for Rosh Hashanah, they were going to pray in the big shul. It's supposed to be called the Khloi. And Rabbi Nathan was collecting Tzedakah. He was traveling all over uh, Ukraine to collect Tzedakah from all the students. Traveling from Cherim to this place to that place to bless that to Nemirov to this to that. And he came across a person, a person who he knew that was close to him. And it was, of course, Tatash Tachabenu, Rabbi Nachman. And this person had nothing, absolutely nothing. He had no money. Really, he had enough money to put food on the table. He had one piece of jewelry that he kept. One piece of jewelry, like a stone, a precious stone. And he told Rabbi Nathan, he said, I have absolutely nothing. I can't give you anything. But all I have is this piece of jewelry. It wasn't even worth that much, this piece of jewelry, I think. He had nothing. I think it was like whatever he had in his savings left, and he gave it to Rabbi Nathan. He said, Rabbi Nathan, I'm giving this to you. Rabbi Nathan, you know what he told him? He said, I know the power of tzedakah, but I can't take this from you. I'm literally killing you if I take this. I can't take it from you. That's all you have. And Rabbi Nathan knew he needed the money. And, of course, Rabbi Nathan needed the money to build the clothes. And the schut to give money to something this big of a cause is huge. But Rabbi Nathan discouraged him from giving it to him. And the man said, Rabbi Nathan, how can you take away the mitzvah of me giving tzedakah to something like this? How? How can you take it away from me? And he starts getting angry at Rabbi Nathan, telling him to take the money. He wants it. And Rabbi Nathan took it. He collected all the money. It was a very minimal amount. Imagine giving 0.5% of something. And when he builds the coins, he does a speech, Rabbi Nathan. And he says, everybody here gave a lot of money. But the person who built this cloth is that person who gave me all his savings. It was like nothing. Who gave me all his money. Why? Because he had to break himself to do it. That's the idea of, of tzedakah. We think that giving tzedakah is the more money you give. No, it's where it hurts. 
where it hurts is where the tzedakah really exists. That's the Avodat Hashem. That's what Rabbi Nachman says. Raki kara aboda le shaber avazariyut. The main Avodat Tzedakah is to break your cruelty. That's the guy in Saka. He's the one who built the cross. No one else. He's the one who did it. Why? Because he broke himself to give that Saka. He literally absolutely took everything that he had to give it. Why? For something big like this. That's the idea of Saka. So, Bizrat Hashem, I hope that we have the Yanguna. That a tzaddik like Rabbi Nachman, a Torah like this, the inf- ideas like this, from the Chesed of Hashem Bar, that can grant us the ability to give Saka. Really, to break it to the point where we really break our cruelty, to get stuck out without thinking too much, to get stuck out with simcha, seva paniyachot, with two hands. That's how we're going to, to break this inyan mishpat so that we can pray properly. God willing, Thank you.